Good morning from London. I'm Anna Edwards alongside Chrissy Gipser. We're an hour away from the opening trade. Here's what you need to know. Oil prices tumble after the Washington Post reports Israel has agreed to avoid attacking Iranian energy facilities, while OPEC's global oil demand forecasts are cut for a third month. European futures edge higher after another record high on Wall Street, fueled by technology shares. Meanwhile, the Fed's Kashkari and Waller talk deliberate and modest rate cuts. British Prime Minister Keir Starmer calls speculation that the UK may raise capital gains tax to as high as 39% as he tries to calm investor jitters ahead of the budget. We'll have more from our exclusive interview. In the meantime, quick check on these markets. Anna, you hit it. This green on the screen. You are seeing a show up in futures, but not a major reaction to the upside. FTSE 100 futures are outperforming by the tune of two-tenths of 1%. The real highlight, though, is the fact that you are seeing some downside sentiment in other asset classes. Euro dollar at a 108 handle, weakness in that currency against the dollar, and Brent crude tumbling almost 4%. The countdown to the opening trade starts right now. Well, quite a lot of speculation is, is getting pretty wide of the mark. But, so you say um, that, 30, that 39 is wide of wide uh, the mark? Is, no, is... Yeah, you know, it's getting to the area which is, is wide of the mark. But I'm not going to fuel the speculation because we can go on like this for a very long time until budget day. Everybody knows that until budget day, uh, none of it is going to be um, revealed. The UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer there. Good morning, everybody. So is speculation about higher taxes or specific higher taxes or specific rates of tax. Is that wide of the mark? That's certainly uh, the message coming through from Keir Starmer in that interview with Stephanie Flanders here at Bloomberg. So we start the programme with that. We start the programme with the UK. Interesting conversations throughout the day yesterday from that investment summit. Then, Chrissy, today the focus, though, on the UK is on the labour market data. What have we got? Yeah, we are seeing some of those wages come bang in line with estimates when you look at those numbers. Looks like a 4.9% increase on a year-over-year -year basis. So, again, not that much change in terms of the data, but enough to slightly, slightly move the markets. You were seeing weakness in cable going into this. You are now seeing some of those losses paired when you look at that rate. But again, uh, it just seems like everything is on track at the moment. Yeah, uh, on track then. So in terms of this headline, well, one of the numbers I know that Bloomberg uh, Economics were looking for was the weekly earnings excluding bonuses. And that has come down from 5.1% to 4.9%. That is in line, as you say, with a lot of the estimates. Um, we had seen some sticky wage concerns in the UK. So as this number continues, Continues to fall, as you say, in line with expectations. That perhaps giving some comfort to those who think we are going to see lower rates here in the UK. And we've seen those comments from Bailey around a bit more aggressive on the rate cuts environment. Uh, but actually, gilt markets had been um, performing based on an expectations around the budget a little bit. And so as we yeah. work our way towards at the end of the month, interesting to see Goldman Sachs saying that they think that the budget will be fairly gilt friendly, kind of in contrast to what we heard from City, who were talking about the potential for a buyer's strike, even if that's not in evidence just yet. Yeah, it's an interesting one that we're, uh, that Keir Starmer had told everyone, Stephanie Flanders, that 39% is is uh, wide of the mark was the was the ex exact phrasing. But he made the, also the key point, which is that markets are going to go back and forth in terms of sort of speculation, and, mm. and they aren't going daily. to... Uh, daily. Which we're <laughs> seeing, right? And, yeah. and everyone seems to be kind of on tenterhooks uh, for that. Another space where people are certainly on tenterhooks is going to be in the Middle East and when yes. it comes to oil prices. Absolutely. Some incredible drops this morning. So Brent prices, 74.57 is where we are, down by 3.7%. A substantial move. And you'd think that that would show up really evidently in a sort of year-to-date chart yeah. of what's happening with oil. And it is a substantial move, but actually we've seen such volatility this year in oil prices that it's it doesn't stand out all that much on the chart, which we're going to show you in just a moment. In fact, it takes us back to almost where we started the year. Now, there's a couple of things to put in here, Chrissy. As we mentioned in the headline, there's this report overnight from the Washington Post. And this actually goes back to last week, the middle of last week, where we saw Israel and the United States having a conversation about what any kind of response to Iran would look like. And now the Washington Post is saying that what Netanyahu promised on that call with Biden is that they won't go after energy assets. They'll go after a military target. So we'll see what other reporting around that same event sort of unearths on that front. But that seems to be what the market is responding to, plus yesterday the fact that OPEC cut its estimates for demand. I should say, though, 
that OPEC's estimates are still way above what a lot of the other people have penciled in, in terms of the level of demand we're seeing around oil. Well, it's fascinating because as we get these geopolitical headlines, we didn't see as much of a spike, to your point, on the upside in oil. But the fact that we're seeing this decrease of almost 4% now in Brent crude, is that 4%, the geopolitical premium that was baked into the price? Is that what we've been seeing that's been this gradual tick up instead of, say, a 4 or 6% spike that we've seen in previous years when there has been mm. oil supply under threat? Uh, it's that kind of pricing that I'm really interested in. Yeah, it's difficult on the downside, isn't it, to work out what is an unwind of geopolitical risk premium yeah. versus, uh, you know, just weaker expectations around China, perhaps. And there is that sense that maybe some of the China news has not lived up to expectations. So that's uh, certainly something that we are watching. Um, let me just get to some news. I think we've got some news coming through from the Dutch banking sector. Chrissy, you got that? Yeah, it absolutely does. It's coming from the Dutch government, seeking to cut their stake in AB and AMRO to about 30% from about just shy of 41%. We'll see how this shakes out. When when it comes to, of course, the markets. Anna, this is going to be something that we've seen from actually a lot of banks and a lot of governments around the world where they are shaving some of those stakes. This has been a theme that we saw over in Germany, of course, with yeah. the Commerce Bank. Now it looks like uh, the Netherlands on that as well. So that's going to be one thing we watch at the market. Open. Absolutely. It's interesting, though, that, that we saw a lot. We had a great story on this just yesterday, actually, about the banking sector as a whole and how a lot of governments have jumped on the period of higher interest rates when banks were making more profits to offload some of those shares yeah. that they built up during the GFC. Uh, now we've seen a turn in interest rates. Maybe some are kind of rushing to catch up with that particular trade. Um, but that's that's where we are on that one. Uh, should we move to, well, that takes us nicely, doesn't it, to say, the interest rate yeah. story? It comes up, especially in the context of windfall taxes here in Europe. But over in the States, it's a question of how much more can the banks really increase their net interest income. J.P. Morgan surprising everyone by saying, actually, even with the outlook on rates being a little bit more dovish for the next 12 months, they're actually outperforming. Today is going to be a great tell of whether or not we're going to see the same thing. I believe Bank of America, City, Goldman, all reporting, are we going to see the same numbers mm. that we saw in J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo? And are we going to end up in those conversations that so annoyed uh, Jamie Dimon on Friday <laughs> yeah. about all of the detail. He right. was making the point that nothing is ever equal when it comes to net interest income. Yeah. So it's not as simple as saying interest rates go higher, banks make more profit, they come down, they make less profit. Of course, there is some of that in there. Uh, but of course, there are other things that go in there. It's not just monetary policy. It's also, you know, whether you're in a recession, how consumers are going to behave, the shape of the yield curve itself, how, what it, you know, how it's performing at different tenors. All of that has an impact on their ability to make money uh, on that net interest margin. No doubt we'll be back, yeah. back to that conversation. Absolutely does in the fundamentals, but the markets don't trade that way. They see rates coming down, the banks drop too. <laughs> and you've got a bunch of bank analysts who, you know, for them, it really matters if they've got all the right inputs going into yeah. their estimate of net interest income. Anyway, no doubt a conversation we will continue uh, to return to. And thinking about the banking sector, uh, we'll have plenty of that coming up later on in the show. We'll also be talking rates with Bank of America's Sophia Salem. Uh, Richard Windsor will join us from Radio Free Mobile, uh, who will be here to talk to us about all kinds of tech and uh, telecoms earnings. Macro Hive's Bilal Hafiz will be with the programme. That's around the market open. Plus, we'll have an exclusive interview with the US Justice Department's top antitrust litigator, Hessel Doshi. Really interesting conversation there then, uh, uh, Critty, with somebody I know that you've, you've spoken to. Yeah, it's a really exciting one as well because we talk about kind of uh, just 21 days away from the election. What does antitrust right now in the States look like and how does that really coincide with some of the scrutiny you're seeing in Europe as well? We're going to have her talking about uh, some of the kind of environment that you're seeing and the hit that you might see in some of those big tech names. We should mention she's also the head litigator and prosecutor at the moment of those ongoing Google and Apple cases. So that exclusive interview coming in just about, just shy about 90 minutes time. You're going to have to tune in. Some other things to put on your agenda as well. About 10 a.m. UK time, German economic sentiment survey is going to be hitting the wire right alongside that Euro area industrial production numbers. And then over in one uh, in the U.S. at about 1.30 p.m. Uh, UK time, Empire manufacturing data is going to be hitting. And of course, it's going to be focused on the New York City area. We'll see how much of that is reflective of the broader economy. But then I think the highlight for maybe the global audience is going to be at about 5 p.m. UK time. Bloomberg's John Micklethwaite, our editor-in-chief, interviewing the former president President of the United States and current Republican candidate Donald Trump. So it's going to be a little big question as well about the economic plans yeah. of both candidates and how serious he is about some of the things he said. Yes, absolutely. I mean, pre uh, former President Trump and, and candidate again, of course, uh, Trump, uh, he held a rally just last night in Pennsylvania and both he and Harris in Pennsylvania at the moment and in fact taking on uh, some of those uh, crucial swing states and some of that blue wall uh, for, for in the case of Harris over the, the next day or so. Interesting that he had this rally in Pennsylvania and actually uh, it was too hot apparently in the building and there were people fainting. Uh, it seemed to turn into some kind of impromptu dance event. But before that, 
that. He was talking about deregulation of the energy sector and the home construction sector. So two themes that he thinks go, will go down well with his with his voters and things that perhaps our editor in chief will pick up on later on today. Yeah, this is part of the part of the idea of how much clarity can we get as we're 21 days away from the election. Is the Trump date actually materializing in these markets the way they have in previous elections? A lot of folks, and I would argue that it absolutely hasn't because we don't know what the plans are. Right. We'll uh, look to see if we can get any more detail on those plans. Here's what else you need to know this morning. U.S. buyout firm Clayton de Billier and Rice at CDNR is working on a package of new commitments to ease French political concern around its deal for Sanofi's consumer health business. Bloomberg has learned that the new guarantees include protections for jobs and local manufacturing plants and keeping the headquarters in France. The Sanofi business could be valued at about 15 billion euros in one of Europe's biggest deals this year. Bloomberg has learned that Italy is aiming to collect 4 billion euros from companies by adjusting some tax thresholds and deductions. The country's finance minister is working on ways to raise money to help fill Italy's 9 billion euro budget shortfall. The final decision on the proposal is expected tonight. And the Biden administration is said to be discussing capping sales of advanced AI chips from NVIDIA and other American firms on a country-specific basis. Sources say the move could set a ceiling on export licenses for certain countries on national security grounds. We're told Persian Gulf countries are in focus because of a growing appetite for AI data centers and the deep pockets needed to fund them. This is a really interesting story. It sort of pulls on a on a thread that we already knew about, which was concern about AI chips going globally and where they're going. But then this story specifically talks about these country limits, possibly on some allies in the Middle East, which is uh, of interest, and, and kind of awkward as well, in the sense that some Europe, uh, US corporates are trying to do more business in data centers in some of these parts of the world, and if they yeah. can't get the chips, so Microsoft, for example, pledged to invest one and a half billion dollars in Abu Dhabi in G42 and if they can't get the chips to do that or not all of them you know what kind of message does that send a really interesting story then about the way that uh, the United States can perhaps use leverage around these chips maybe wants to get there before China does all of those kind of geopolitical forces it absolutely is it's interesting how the market's interpreting it though because going into when the story hit the wire you didn't actually see much of a hit when it came to the chip sector over at least in Asia of course this comes off to the heels of just 24 hours ago in the US Yes, the NVIDIA closed at yet another record high since I believe uh, the highest going back to June was still a very, very high number when you look at those numbers. It shows up in a lot of those Asian stocks as well. The Kosdaq is my favorite to go into, or the Kospi. Basically, all the chip stocks that you're seeing mm. in Asia and Japan and South Korea, they're still taking their tune from NVIDIA and not the regulation that comes out. Yes, and it is worth lingering on that uh, that sort of uh, original NVIDIA story around concerns around Blackwell chips, because that's something that's yeah. weighed on the share price of NVIDIA for many weeks. But actually, we've had these reassuring words from the CEO, Jensen Huang, and that was one of the things that allowed you know Wall Street to get to, what was it, the 46 record close yesterday? Sounds about right. I mean, I'm completely losing track now. Well, it's the biggest weight in the S&P 500, to your point. But then it's also having an effect on the likes of advanced micro devices. We had this conversation, uh, I believe, uh, last week as well, um, when we're talking about this idea that even the competitors are really being punished for saying, you have to really wow us to be able to compete in this market. We're going to see how that all shakes out amid the chip sector. Coming up on the program, though, we're going to bring you more from our exclusive interview with UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer, including what he thinks about the IPO space and the Shein listing. Plus, tech regulation looming large. We're going to discuss that and more with DOJ's Hedel Doshi in another exclusive interview. But up next, back to the markets. Fed Governor Christopher Waller and Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari giving their takes on policy outlooks. Are they turning dovish, more dovish perhaps, past November? We're going to discuss. If you have any questions for us or for our guests, dive into the conversation. Send them to us. IB plus BBTV Go is a function on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. So 2% is our inflation target. Depending on your measure of inflation, it went up to 7, 8, 9%. And it is now running, I would call it at around, by our primary measure, it's now running at around a 2.5% run rate. And a lot of evidence suggesting that it's going to continue to fall from here. That was Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari. We also heard from the Fed's Christopher Waller. This scenario implies to me that we can proceed with moving policy toward a neutral stance at a deliberate pace. This path would be based on the judgment that the risks to both sides of our dual mandate are balanced. 
Joining us now, Sophia Salem, Head of European Rate Strategy at B of A Global Research. Sophia, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming to speak to us this morning. There's lots to talk about in Europe, and we'll get to the ECB and all of that conversation. But we were just hearing some, some comments there by Kashkari and by Walla, and the things that stood out to me from both of them is some of the language they're choosing to use. You know, Walla talking about moving at a cautious and deliberate pace, Kashkari talking about modest cuts. From a global perspective, I know your focus is Europe, but just thinking about the global backdrop to European rate cuts. Are you, uh, do, we, do we hear messaging from the Fed that's designed to tell us this is 25, this is not 50 again that's coming next time? I think that is uh, becoming clearer now for the US and the picture indeed in the jobs market or, or any uh, of the latest data really seem to have surprised to the upside. So there is room for a bit more caution here from the Fed and a messaging that contrasts really with the 50 basis point cut that they delivered in September. But for the ECB, it's a little bit different. Mm. We're actually finally seeing them uh, open up to the idea of a, a more regular um, pace of cuts. And uh, this... Um, uh, cut that we're expecting now for uh, this week uh, is actually coming as a, as a surprise relative to the messaging that uh, um, they uh, sent in uh, the September meeting. Yes, yes, let's cast our minds back to that because just after the September meeting, we did seem to get this messaging from various ECB voices that suggested that's it for now, you know, we'll do an, maybe we'll revisit in December, I think it was at the time. But things have moved quickly, have they? Um, Sophia, is it because the data has deteriorated faster than, than we'd expected? I think so, yes. I think that um, relative to ECB forecast, clearly um, data is moving um, lower. We are starting to hear some concerns around the labor market, uh, and to us that is really uh, key, of course. But at the same time, uh, maybe the Fed delivering 50 basis point helped also um, the ECB open up to the idea of uh, um, going at every meeting mm. now. Sophia, what are they responding to, though? If, you're, if your thought here is that you expect more cuts than perhaps the market is pricing in at the moment, what is it that they're responding to, given that weakness in Europe has been an ongoing factor for, we'll say, four or five years, certainly post-pandemic, and we haven't really climbed out of it? Uh, what is the specific piece of data that they're, they're speaking to here? I think for them, there, is, uh, there are two things. First, uh, we're getting clearer signal from inflation that uh, uh, we are on track to hitting the two percent target medium term. If you look actually at the details in terms of services inflation and you um, do a seasonally adjusted um, analysis bottom up, you actually find that over the past three months we've been at target already. Yeah. So the signals on the inflation side are quite clear and on top of that you now add risks around growth that are clearly to the downside with now the emergence of those labor market concerns. It's certainly something to keep in mind. That's the monetary side of it. Let's talk about the fiscal side of it as, as well, uh, simply because we've had a very dramatic summer when it comes to European bond yields, certainly in the French bond market as well. There is a concern about whether or not every country in Europe needs a rate cut at this very moment. For example, the outperformance in the periphery, driven by so much of that fiscal spend, has really stood out to the point that it's attracting bond investors from around the world. I'm pointing to, to Greece, to Italy, to Spain, as, of course. How sustainable is that? Is that just a function of weakness in France? Well, um, we can say that at the end of the day, we have to think that um, if Germany is in recession, um, it's going to be um, quite quick to see also the effect over onto the periphery. It's not immediate because we have seen, in particular, large fiscal support and coming on in part from NGU. But at the end of the day, we cannot stay in a situation where Germany is in permanent recession and the periphery remains isolated from that. Um, Germany is the number one export market for all these countries. So uh, our view is still that um, uh, at the end, the ECB has, will have to be focused really on the downside um, growth risk that are emerging clearly in, in Germany and uh, the normalization that we will also see in peripheral growth towards uh, um, pre-pandemic levels uh, now that uh, NGU effect will slowly um, mm. fade. So the ECB will be leaning towards setting a policy rate 
I mean, they won't use these words, but that works better for Germany? Is that, is that the, the thinking then, Sophia? Uh, I guess for the euro area as a whole, if you think that uh, only peripheral countries will be affected by the outlook in, in Germany. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I did. Yeah. At the moment, it is really the, the signal. And, and what about the, the, the rate of inflation? I keep talking about this with guests, but I notice you put it in your notes and, and have reflected on it yourself, so I wanted to ask you about it. What about the medium-term assumptions we should make about inflation? Because lots of guests and, and, and uh, economists and investors talk to us about how maybe inflation from here won't be what it was post-GFC, but central banks still have the same targets they had post-GFC you know that they haven't changed those substantially and so should we ha should we be thinking about inflation uh, or, or rather rates not getting down to the levels we saw post gfc ha talk to us about how that plays out a slightly higher inflation environment due to the things you cite defense deglobalization decarbonization demographics lots of these things can be seen as slightly inflationary we tend to take the other side of that in the sense that uh, we feel that we're probably moving back to um at least pre-COVID levels uh, in terms of um, um, ECB rates. And probably it is the case that uh, uh, neutral rate hasn't really moved higher since uh, pre-COVID. And is Europe going to be different to other parts of the world in that? I think there is a distinction, yes. If there is one region of the world where you can argue that there is possibly a move higher in neutral rate, that would be the US. Mm. But in Europe, we're actually thinking that if anything, neutral rates have moved lower. Um, Europe saves uh, more than pre-COVID and it uh, spends less in terms of capex as well relative to pre-COVID. What does that do to bond issuance in Europe? Um, bond issuance uh, uh, in net terms uh, for private investors will still be rising probably next year because we have to account for the effects of ECB QT here. Uh, so while fiscal deficit might be a bit lower next year, um, private investors will have to absorb more. Um, but, yeah, the picture is still very different from uh, other regions where uh, the increase in supply mm. is likely to be even more significant. Sophia, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Sophia Salem, Head of uh, European Rate Strategy at B of A Global Research. A number of interesting things there, uh, Kriti. A, a number of interesting contrasts, actually, across the Atlantic, both in terms of the medium-term inflation picture maybe not materially so, but to some degree, maybe we, we land at a different inflation rate versus pre-pandemic uh, yeah. inflation rates. I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. And the way that the cut of 50 by the Fed has some impact on the ECB, even if it doesn't obviously mean, oh, therefore they cut 50 as well, but maybe there is some sort of you know, link between the two. Yeah, perhaps... Uh forging the path to do that if they absolutely need to. I think it's also interesting we come compared to pre-pandemic is what is actually driving inflation because off the case of pa the pandemic it was geopolitical tensions initially coming from Russia and Ukraine. Now we're talking about geopolitical tensions in the Middle East moving the markets even more. Before it was supply chain issues. Now we've absorbed some of that. It's more of a wage story. Mm -hmm. There's plenty going on in terms of coordinating where the what piece of the economy needs some response. We're going to be diving into more of that conversation ahead of the opening trades across Europe. But coming up on this program, the U.S. is weighing capping the sale of AI chips to some countries, broadening restrictions beyond just China. This may include the Netherlands. We know that there has been a little bit of a catch-22 in terms of the Dutch government and how they deal with ASML, given that, of course, it is a globally strategic company that has implications for around the world. We're going to bring you the details next and, of course, the market reaction off that Bloomberg exclusive. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Technology has hurt people. We've had excessive automation in the past 40 years. We've not generated enough new good jobs, so jobs where you actually get paid good money and, and you can live well. And we've got to do better on that. I think that that's really a fundamental driving importance, irrespective of the election outcome. Simon Johnson there speaking to Bloomberg about the potential dangers of excessive technology for the labour market. Johnson, alongside two others, won the 2024 Nobel Prize for Economics yesterday for their work on wealth disparities between nations and in particular their work on post-colonial wealth and how that has an impact on how countries perform. But interesting in that soundbite we were just playing there, he's talking about how uh, technology you know, is moving on, it's evolving and there's a sort of sense of inevitability about some of that, but making sure that it that it brings good jobs 
and that people stay employed, everybody stays employed, rather yeah. than just a few people making a lot of money out of it, seems to be the perspective that he's bringing to the sort of tech and AI race. Wasn't this the debate between Sam Altman and Elon Musk when it comes to development of AI, just how uh, revolutionary that this product is, but at the end of the day, potentially harmful if not treated in the right way? Certainly something that perhaps is hanging over whether or not there is a sustainable investment case that isn't uh, subject to some of that regulation or regulatory scrutiny that we may see in tech. In the meantime, geopolitics plays a role as well. Bloomberg has learned that the U.S. may cap sales of AI chips to certain countries. The move could limit artificial artificial intelligence capabilities in places like the Middle East. For example, the measures would set a ceiling on export licenses in the interest of national security. Let's get a little bit more perspective and bring in Richard Windsor, founder and owner of research firm Radio Free Mobile. Richard, a pleasure to have you on the program again. Look, we spent most of this year and uh, I want to say most of the last couple of years talking about just how great AI is and how NVIDIA is the darling of that space. But given that over half of its revenue comes from abroad, is this a geopolitical overhang that may be threatening that kind of golden child nest, for lack of a better term, for NVIDIA? Uh, in the short term, no. Um, very simply is if NVIDIA can't sell its products overseas, there's going to be plenty of demand elsewhere. If you look at some of the reports at the moment, um, you know, the reports are that NVIDIA is Blackwell is already sold out 12 months in advance. So, and you saw this again when when China, when other restrictions were placed on NVIDIA shipping into China, um, the demand was easily absorbed elsewhere. So short term, not a problem. The other thing to bear in mind is at the moment, it's what we refer to as geopolitical season, which is every October, the Department of Commerce updates its export rules as it relates to the technology battle that it is currently with China. And that's what's going on right now, which is why you've got a non a lot of news flow around that particular topic right now. But Richard, in terms of trading the stock, I mean, we're 21 days until the U.S. election. And I'm curious why or perhaps if some of this geopolitical tension in terms of what a new uh, president may look like over in the States affects the pricing around some of these tech darlings, given, to your point, we're in that kind of geopolitical palooza at the moment. What is the market missing? Um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure it's missing an enormous amount because the when you look at the geopolitical situation and you then look at how that's playing out in the technology sector, effectively what is going on is there is what we refer to as ideological struggle between the West, USA primarily, and China. And that battle is being fought in the technology sector. Now, when you take that and you flip it into what does that mean given that there is a big election in the United States coming up, the short answer is not much. And the reason for that is, again, over the last five years that we've been covering this, there isn't that much disagreement between the two different parties in the US in terms of what the policy should be towards China. They may express that policy very, very differently, but when it comes to the nuts and bolts, they are effectively the same. And so that's why we don't see, whatever the outcome is in November, we don't see that there's going to be an enormous shift in terms of how the U.S. is facing off with China in this particular struggle. Mm. So, so, Richard, so the view on China quite consistent across the aisle, which is a, a, a point you're making there. What about the, the, the sort of ideological view on export of these chips to other countries? Because on the one hand, I could see politicians in the States making the argument that you don't want to export them if you're not sure what they're going to be used for and you want to make sure you stay ahead of the pack. On the other hand, you might want to export them to get there before China supplies, uh, supplies some, of your, some of your allies with chips. How do you think conceptually regulators in the United States will be thinking about that? That's a very good question. Um, what we're seeing at the moment is most of the concerns around shipping to other countries, particularly country, some countries in the Middle East, is that it's not they're not actually destined to stay in the Middle East, but are actually being, then being re-exported to countries where the US Department of Commerce has decided these chips should not go anyway, particularly Russia, China, probably Iran as well. Um, now, when you look at uh, the policy that is being enacted in the Middle East in particular, is what you are seeing is there historically there has been quite a uh, deep relationship between the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia with China for technology. What you are starting to see now is 
that both the UAE and the restorers today that Saudi Arabia are starting to pivot more towards uh, the United States. And so I think when it comes to from that perspective, what you will see is once the US is more comfortable with where these countries are going, it will be easier to ship uh, chips into this region. But I think most of the concerns really at the moment are around re-export to blocked countries rather than mm. the actual use in the countries themselves. Yeah. Richard, before we started talking quite so much about NVIDIA as we do these days, when we were talking about telecom equipment and the way that geopolitics plays out in that particular space, there was Huawei, and then Huawei was taken out of a lot of European networks, and the beneficiaries of that were supposed to be Ericsson and Nokia. We've had you know, some strong numbers, it looks like, out of Ericsson today. And to what extent is that because they're able to take advantage of that, uh, th those geopolitical developments, or is it entirely another story? I think, to be honest with you, it's another story here. Um, you know, the story for a long time, for many, many years, was that the, the, the mobile infrastructure market was a duopoly between Ericsson and Huawei. And the main story was is that if Huawei was removed from many markets, then Nokia would be able to move in and, and fill, that, fill that space. To some degree, that's happened, but it hasn't happened nearly enough. Um, and as a result of that, and combined with the fact that the weakness in the economy that you saw over the last couple of years has really meant that the mobile infrastructure market has been a very difficult market, and I suspect it will continue to be a fairly difficult market. There's also the problem for the likes of Ericsson and Nokia of uh, what they call ORAN, which is kind of like open source mobile networks, which decreases their ability to lock customers in and make high margins, which is yet another concern going forward for the long term. Richard, talk to us a little bit about competition here. I mean, we started this co this segment talking about NVIDIA as well. In the last couple of days, AMD has also revealed its own kind of chip offering, and yet the market didn't love it. They thought the barriers to entry for this was, was simply too high, which brings me nicely to regulatory scrutiny in, 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 in the area. What does a competitor of NVIDIA need to prove that they can compete? Uh, it's not a question of what they can prove, it's what they can deliver. The, the thing is, when I look at NVIDIA compared to everybody else, if you look at it just on the quality of the silicon, NVIDIA is good and it comes out with new products quicker than anyone else, but it's not necessarily a better builder of chips than anyone else. What NVIDIA has is what's called CUDA, which is the development platform, which is if you're going to use NVIDIA to train artificial intelligence, you will program and build your model using the CUDA development platform. It's been around for 20 years. Everyone knows how to use it. It's the most mature and everyone demands it. In this generation and only this generation of artificial intelligence, it is the control point. And that is why NVIDIA has 85% plus market share at 75% plus gross margins. No one is really going to get a look in until they can crack that problem of that control point that NVIDIA has such a firm grip on. What does that do to pricing, Richard? It means it remains high, um, as you can see from NVIDIA's gross margins. Um, the others are going to try and undercut it, but quite frankly, what NVIDIA is very, very good at this. If you look at the, 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 block, the, the Blackwell proposition is as follows. You had the H100, it was great. Here's Blackwell. Now, what Blackwell will do for you is you will be able to train your AI using one quarter the number of chips and one quarter the amount of electricity. And what we're going to do is we're going to split that, split that uh, gain with you, i.e. your AI becomes 50% cheaper and we get the benefit of a 50% increase in price. That's how it works. Given NVIDIA is sold out 12 months in advance and no one else is getting a look in, I would say that strategy is working very nicely. <laughs> very nice explanation, Richard. Uh, thinking about regulatory, and uh, Kriti mentioned regulatory uh, conversations around this sector, takes me to Google. I mean, there's been talk over the last week or so about the possibility. It's all kind of very legal uh, talk about the possibility of, of a breakup of Google. It was mentioned in uh, one of the many options that, that one particular uh, a legal case could resort to, but it seems in many people's views to be, you know, just one of many options and not likely to happen, and even if it did, would be challenged. What are your thoughts on any kind of breakup of Google? Well, it's going to be a very, very long time coming, uh, I think is, base, is, is the short answer there, and this is, this is effectively what we wrote about um, a couple of weeks ago. 
Now, the interesting thing is, it's kind of ironic that anti-competitive action is being taken for the at the point at which Google faces its greatest competitive threat in 20 years, which is the fact that there is a possibility that the nature of how people search for information on the internet may change. And, you know, if people start to use, start to look for more generative answers rather than a list of blue links, then the whole monetization model may change. And what that is, is it's, your, it's your typical market dislocation. Now, what you find is, is, is that whenever you get a market dislocation of that nature, it's an opportunity for competitors to come in. If you look at the generative AI space, there is no shortage of competitors just waiting to jump in and steal some of Google's lunch. Whether they're, whether they're able to yeah. do so remains to be seen. And this is why it's interesting from an appeal point of view. By the time we get to the point at which Google appeals the ruling, the, the market may actually be very different. Certainly something we're going to be keeping a very, very close eye on. Richard Windsor, founder and owner of Radio Free Mobile, weighing in on the tech landscape. Later in the show, we're going to stick with that theme over in Alphabet and Google and regulation. We're going to dive deeper into the world of tech in an exclusive interview with the U.S. Justice Department's top antitrust litigator, Hedel Doshi, joining the program at 8.30 a.m. London time. Very excited, Anna, for that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So that coming up uh, in just under an hour's time, 50 minutes or so. Coming up on the program before that, though, two major European banks in focus. As shareholders look to cut major stakes, uh, we will have more on that sector. It's part of our stocks to watch next. This is Big Ben. Well, I think we've got to get the balance right, and um, clearly we've got to have standards, high standards. We do have high standards, um, not least, for example, in rights at work, and I addressed that in my speech here today to say, look, better rights and protection for people in their workplace are good for growth. So we're clear where we stand on standards, but you know, we're future-looking, we're pragmatic, and subject to those standards, then yes, we do want investment into the United Kingdom because we desperately need growth in this country. We haven't had meaningful growth in the economy in the United Kingdom for 14 long years. We're determined to turn that but, around. But just to be clear on that, so you, the government would need to in, be sure that Sheen's not using forced labour in Xinjiang before it could list in, in the UK? Well, I'm not going to get into individual businesses. What I will say, and be very clear about it, standards and high standards do matter to us. So of course we'll be looking at any issue that goes to high standards. Uh, with a particular feature on um, the rights of the workforce, um, we've been really clear that we see that as um, two sides of the same coin when it comes to growth. Good employment rights and protections, and a lot of drag on growth, uh, they're fundamental for growth. And I think pretty well all good businesses understand that, which is why in many cases they've already put in place some of the rights and protections that we are bringing forward in legislation. The UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer there speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Head of uh, Economics and Government, Stephanie Flanders, about the IPO scrutiny. Uh, some, of that, uh, some of that conversation really interesting around Sheehan then, uh, Critty, and what the government is going to decide on that front. Because we remember when that particular business tried to list in the United States, it was deemed by politicians on both sides of the aisle, it seemed, yeah. uh, to not be a business that they wanted to list in the, in the US. It's a really interesting one as well because the the kind of workaround of that was that, well, London doesn't have high standards. At least that was the argument uh, uh, against it, dare I say it, whereas uh, Keir Starmer's really trying to increase that. That being said, the, the appeal that exists in London that maybe doesn't exist in New York as well is simply this idea that it's a more accessible market to investors in Dubai, Shanghai, et cetera, whereas New York does have the... the multiples that Guy loves to talk about uh, mm. when he's here, and that does sometimes make it an inaccessible listing. Well, let's see where that one goes uh, on that particular business. You didn't want to be drawn on the individual company, of course. And let us talk about the broader markets. Our Markets Live executive editor, Mark Cudmore, with us this morning to talk about the markets. Um, Mark, let's talk about oil prices, because this is a standout mover this morning, down by 3.5% at the time of speaking, 74.73 on the Brent price. Um, it's been a volatile year for oil prices, but even by those standards, that's a pretty big move. A confluence of factors playing into the hands of oil bears, it seems, today. 
Yeah, I think it's a really, really interesting uh, how low oil prices are. Given the news flow of the last month, we've obviously having an escalating situation in the Middle East. Um, and, you know, almost by the day it's been escalating. And even though China's stimulus has disappointed some very optimistic hopes, we still have a load of China stimulus that has come through from where we were a month ago. We've had U.S. growth be upgraded. Everything from the demand side, uh, or sorry, from, I guess the Middle East is also supply side, everything you think from the news flow side should be supportive for oil prices. And yet they're not far off the bottom end of the range the last couple of years. And I think that shows that there's just such an overhang of supply that is ultimately waiting to come in the market. And that's really the factor kind of going forward for next year. So I think the, the long term story for oil is that we're going to get spikes on demand stories or on news flow disruption. But ultimately, it seems to me that oil prices have a lot of downside over the next couple of years. Well, Mark, we've heard that argument so many times in that because the market is so well supplied by the United States and, and others, therefore there is no geopolitical premium. But is it fair to say that the $3, almost $3 drop we're seeing in Brent crude this morning is a geopolitical premium that was baked into this market? Uh, you know, it does seem like a bit of an overreaction, I guess, which is your interpretation in the very short term. But I guess it reflects the fact that you've just got such underlying pressure on oil prices that it's those who are, are betting on a, a bullish surprise that are the weak hands. And so when you remove that risk premium, they're the ones that have to capitulate. And I think that's the long running story here. It's not that we can't get oil price spikes again, but it's that it's going to continue to get downside. And you've got to remember, oil prices on an inflation adjusted uh, basis have not done well at all in recent years, not just where they are in nominal terms, but inflation adjusted, they've done even worse. OK, let's talk about U.S. stocks for a moment then, Mark, because we've seen, uh, you know, I'm just checking my numbers, 46 year to date high for U.S. stocks in yesterday's session. It's easy to lose track. And a reminder that it's the technology sector can, can, can be to the fore, can be the thing that sets the pace. And that certainly will be something we focus on during the earnings story. Yeah, look, as you know, I've been bullish stocks all year. I continue to be bullish. I'm wondering what's going to derail it. So I don't think earnings are going to derail it. Expectations are pretty low. And we know the economy did well in the third quarter. We know there's still demand for chips on the, the, the AI side. So earnings will likely be supportive. Um, I am worried about ultimately whether the election might derail it. What's the timing for that? If earnings are going to be supportive, but we're only three weeks away from the election, how do you kind of play off those two uh, inputs? Overall, U.S. stocks are expensive. But remember, we're in a wonderful macro environment that remains very supportive overall. All right. Bloomberg Markets Live Executive Editor Mark Cudmore joining us for the oil moves and broader markets this morning. Get more up-to-date analysis from him and the team. Just type in MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Let's go from the macro to the micro. Joe Easton standing by with our stocks to watch. Joe. Morning, Critty. So we've got a couple of big share sales for the European banks today. Firstly, Deutsche Bank, a single shareholder, is looking to offload around 250 million euros worth of stock, according to our reporting. Now, this is a share price that has actually outperformed recently, given strength in the company's trading business. So potentially a good time to be selling that. And there is only a small discount on that one. Then over in Amsterdam, the Dutch government looking to offload another chunk of their stake in AB and AMRO. They're going to bring their stake down to 30%. It's currently at 40% and they already sold around 1.5 billion euros worth of the company just last month. That one's kind of traded in line with the market, but both of those potentially are going to see some movement on those share sales today. Then over in telecoms, Ericsson, this one is getting a strong reading in terms of their earnings. They're talking about a rebound in some of their key businesses. This is the quote that we've got from the statement today. We expect our network sales to stabilise, driven by good growth in North America, although they do anticipate further sales pressure in the enterprise business, according to them. Now, the stock has had a decent run over the past year, up around 45%, but but in fact, if we look a bit longer term, we can see it's a bit of a long term sufferer in terms of the share price. They did lose a few key contracts a few years ago, but they have now got a big deal with AT&T. So looking to recover some of those declines. Then in terms of oil, as Mark was discussing, that big move in crude futures today, Brent down more than 3 percent at the moment on reports that Israel won't strike Iranian crude infrastructure, potentially benefiting supply. And that 
crude price is looking like it's going to weigh on a couple of the oil stocks today, particularly those in London like BP and Shell, also Total in France, Repsol in Spain and any over in Italy. All of those potentially are going to be weaker at the open of trading today. Then finally, in your analyst ratings, we have got some decent ones coming up. We can see the oil price there coming down, but there's NatWest. This one really catching my eye this morning. Double upgraded at Jefferies. It was previously the only sell rated company on NatWest and they've gone to buy today. Then Philips, an upgrade over at Otto this morning in the healthcare space. And finally, over at Morgan Stanley, they're actually downgrading a lot of their price targets on semiconductor stocks with potentially some weakness in the likes of Eikstron this morning. Keep an eye on the chips in European trading. Thank you very much, Joe. Our equities reporter, Joe Easton. So, Critty, uh, Joe says keep an eye on chips. And actually, tech stocks were the best performing sector yesterday, so up by 1.7%. So another reason, perhaps, to watch yeah. the chip sector. If we are seeing any change in, in thinking there, uh, they had a really good run yesterday. It feels like it's going to be perhaps a defensive trade when we look at what the makeup of this market looks like. Of course, oil is going to be on the back foot as well, given the macro move that we're seeing. Almost 4% on Brent crude. It's just shy of $75 a handle. That is coming up next. The opening trades across Europe. Futures pointing a slightly lower at the moment. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everybody. A few minutes then until we get you that opening trade for this Tuesday morning. Uh, we are watching for a little bit of upside at the start of trade. And some of that coming from uh, sentiment in yesterday's session over in the United States. This in the white line is the European session of yesterday. And yes, we tracked higher as U.S. markets opened pretty strongly at the start of Monday's session. Uh, and we maintained some of that strength. But U.S. markets carried on the rest of their day with a little bit of a gain. And so as a result, there might be a little bit of upside for us to play for here in Europe. And you can see that in the futures picture. Uh, Critty was right before the break to suggest there was a bit of a more mixed, slightly negative picture in the U.S. futures. But we've got here the futures picture for Europe, up by three-tenths of one percent on Eurostox 50 futures. Uh, uh, FTSE futures higher, CAC futures only by a little. And yesterday we saw uh, that some of those luxury names, consumer products and services names, Critty, were weighed down in Paris as a result of concerns around China. Perhaps there's another day of that. But we have plenty more to factor in today around bank earnings. We're waiting for more of that news flow and around the oil price as well. We certainly do. And that bank story is, I think, going to be a crucial one, especially as we see some of that shake out around ABN AMRO. At the start of this program, Anna, we talked about the fact that the Dutch government may be pulling back on their stake as well, down to about 30 percent approximately in ABN AMRO. How does the market react to that, given the volatility we've seen around Commerce Bank and uh, the shakeout in the German banking sector as well? Ericsson, of course, as well, beating those estimates, a $14 billion AT&T bet paying off to the Swedish uh, telecom giant. We're going to keep an eye on how that shakes out as well. But then, Anna, you really hit it. That oil stock story, you were seeing Brent create just a shy of $75 a handle, a barrel, excuse me, uh, down about 4%. Do we see a more magnified move in the FTSE 100 off the back of that move? Yeah, absolutely. A substantial move in oil prices. So, uh, yeah, as you say, down by more than 3.5%, down by $3 or so. Uh, so certainly focus in on uh, any underperformance coming through in the London market as a result of that or any weakness that we see in energy stocks more broadly. The FTSE 100 is the only one we have trading so far, and it is pretty flat, looking for a bit more upside in other markets perhaps. So the IBEX up by three-tenths of 1%. The stock 600 as a whole then getting a price and up by a tenth of a percent. So very modest gains coming through as perhaps we look to catch up a little bit with what happened in the United States, as we were just discussing in yesterday's session. But it was technology stocks that led us higher stateside. Some of the more reassuring words around NVIDIA and its Blackwell chips and uh, whether it's able to deliver everything that customers want. Um, uh, it, it can't deliver everything that customers want. We know that. Really oversubscribed those orders. Uh, but certainly that's been part of the focus stateside. And we saw tech do really well yesterday. Uh, here in Europe, then, back to this uh, back to this moment. And the CAC guarantee is down a tenth of a percent. So continuing some of that weakness, perhaps, that we saw yesterday on that market, Critty, and the DAX up by four tenths of one percent. What do you see if you dive a little deeper? Well, it's just literally a tale of two, two very different sectors. That outperformance in tech that you were talking about, you said it, Anna. ASML, your biggest index contributor to the upside, perhaps taking its tone from that 
that record move that you saw over in the States as well. You certainly saw that shake out in Asia. So ASML is going to be up there alongside SAP, some of the other tech names that we see in this region. But the downside, the heavy hitters are absolutely going to be in the commodity space. And that's where you're seeing the red on the screen this morning. Your biggest uh, index drop or index weight is from Shell, Total, BP. You name your energy company in Europe, it is trading lower today off of that macro move. And by some margin as well. So BP yeah. down by 3.7%. Total Energy is down by more than 3%. So we're seeing substantial moves in some of these uh, oil names. On the back of this, uh, this much weaker oil price, down by 3.8%, as we said, uh, on the Brent price, 74.55. And, Chrissy, worth reminding ourselves that this is a, a write-up... Well, two things here. There's the OPEC revision to its expectations and what that tells us about the demand story, which I guess the market kind of knew. And then there's an unwind of some of the geopolitical premium that we're seeing here perhaps on the back of that Washington Post story that is just sort of like a just a, a revisit of last yeah. week's meeting between Netanyahu and Biden and what they say has was said by the Israelis about their commitments to not attack energy infrastructure. And we just had this conversation with Mark Cudmore over uh, on our Markets Live team as well is that does this mean that there was this a geopolitical premium baked into the price at the end of the day or is this simply positioning? Is this a kind of shakeout around some of the options that we've seen in, in the energy sector and in, in oil as well? That's going to be uh, something we factor into the equation, as well as how you position in these European markets broadly. We spoke to Julian Howard from GAM Investments yesterday about how Europe is permanently playing catch-up to the United States. Take a listen to what he had to say. It's very hard to get excited about Europe, but it's quite easy to get excited about America. We have lots of European equity managers here who show you the chart of the discount, mm -hmm. percentage discount MSCI Europe Isn't versus MSCI. Yeah. Isn't it cheap? But it never changes. It's a perma-discount. You know, and you can't keep arguing that there's a discount unless you've got a really strong case for that discount window being closed. But it just never closes, really. Let's, let's get another perspective there. Bilal Hafiz, CEO and research head over at MacroHive, joins us around the table. All right, so Julian Howard there called it a PERMA discount. When does a PERMA discount disappear? I think, uh, as its name suggests, I think it's going to be around for a while. I think the only hope for Europe would be if there's a strong cyclical um, upswing um, and then the discount would, would reduce. But I don't think that's forthcoming. I think Europe has ongoing issues. But in particular right now, it's the fact that Germany is lagging the rest of Europe. And if, if Germany is the one that's lagging, that's a real problem for, for the European stock markets. Is there a way to separate that, though? And we talked about this earlier on the program with the guest in the bond space who was saying that uh, basically the point that you just made, that if Germany's in recession, it takes the periphery down with it. But the periphery at the moment is almost cushioned by so much fiscal spend and, and outperformance and tourism revenue. Is there a lag to catch up to that German recessionary kind of spillover? Or is this an inevitable doom for, for all of Europe? Well, that's a great point. I think for now, I think peripheral Europe could escape some of the weakness we're seeing in Germany. Because as you said, some of the factors that are driving the strength in, in the peripheral Europe is things like tourism. There's certain catch-up consumer demand, which isn't necessarily linked to Germany. And moreover, Germany's weakness is specific to its, its own sectors that are doing poorly, in particularly the auto sector, which is not related to what happens in Spain and Italy. So I do think the periphery could continue to outperform uh, relative to Germany, at least for the next three to six months. So there could be this, this period where they don't uh, catch down to Germany. Mm. And, and picking up, yeah, running with this theme a little more, Bilal, about divergence within Europe, are we going to be having conversations soon about how one ECB rate doesn't work for everybody? Because that, that could be, if, if you can contrast what's happening between the German and the Spanish economies, they look so different. Yeah, I mean, this will be, you know, the continual story for Europe uh, as, as a whole. And in the end, what to, to, the way to deal with this is to have differential fiscal policy, you know, which there is some scope for that. But this, this will be this ongoing challenge. And if you look at the, the wage data within Europe, it has been relatively robust. So although Germany needs interest rate cuts, uh, the rest of Europe doesn't. And that's probably one of the reasons why the ECB may not necessarily cut as much as everyone thinks. OK, so if Europe's on a perma discount, are there opportunities, though, within that? Because, you know, not every, there must be some things that are, are being sold off because they are maybe caught up in a, in a German basket and a bit of gloom around the German economy, but actually are much more to do with forward-looking investment trends and, and where you can make some money. So are there things in Germany or elsewhere in Europe, Bilal, that get you excited right now? Yeah, I think elsewhere in Europe, I, I think one could look at that at a country level. So I think Spain and Italy, for example, are under-owned relative to, say, Germany. Moreover, there are kind of the tourism play that one could have. So there are sort of tourism-linked sectors that one could do. Within Germany, it's, it's harder to find a, an obvious play because the industrial sector looms so large within Germany. And outside of that, it's really the banking sector, which is the other play, which at the moment doesn't look that, that interesting or it looks challenged at the moment to come up with a, a positive thesis for that. Speaking of the banking sector... 
there are several fiscal policies that are kind of driving it. We talked about it today where uh, the Dutch government is, is cutting down a stake in, in AB and AMRO. We've heard it in Commerce Bank. We're talking about cross-border consolidation, but then also windfall taxes. How are you supposed to interpret the banking sector right now in the macro environment of lower interest rate cuts coming down the pipeline? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the starting point would be where is net interest income going to be for all of the, these banks? So that's to do with the shape of the yield curve as interest rates go down. In theory, you would expect that uh, profits would go down. But the U.S. earnings so far show that hasn't been the case. J.P. Morgan's earnings last week showed that their net interest, interest income actually went up. Um, but in general, that's the first starting point. So in, in general, that's perhaps a negative story for, for Europe at the moment. Um, uh, the other side is all the, the cross-border purchases and, and, and so on. And I think one of the things we've seen in Europe for the last 10 years is that to do cross-border border financial institution integrations is very, very hard because although it's supposed to be a European uh, wide market, in the end when it comes to banks, it's a national market. Mm. Bilal, Jamie, uh, Jamie Dimon seems to be a bit annoyed about all that focus on net interest income <laughs> in, the, uh, in the call with analysts. But, you know, you can see where it comes from, from their part, you know, point of view. They'd all expected that these profits would fall and then they didn't. And so they're sort of not trying to understand, well, what do we not get about the way that the yield curve plays into your ability to make profits? Um, so you can understand why he gets quizzed on it. Um, it. It is a complicated business, though, is it? This relationship between where yields go where the yield curve goes and the bank's ability to make money on on deposits and lending and all the things that add up to that net interest income. Yes, absolutely. I mean, obviously, Jamie Dimon didn't like the fact that people focusing on this. He, he criticised analysts for wanting the numbers for their models. But in the end, this is how people uh, assess the value of these banks. The, the challenge ultimately is um, what are the lags through which the different parts of the curve transmit to, to a mm. bank? So uh, have banks passed on higher interest rates to depositors? In many cases, they haven't. So you, in your bank account, you don't have high interest rates necessarily. And then on the other side, um, how many mortgages are people taking out? Which bank can then earn higher interest on. So the challenge in the US market has been the mortgage market's been relatively weak. It's picked up recently uh, somewhat. And then the deposit rate, uh, banks haven't passed through high interest rates all the way through. Um, so that complicates the, the, the picture on, in, in, in all of this. But on the other side of that is, and, and this was, I think, the weak point in some of the JP Morgan and Wells Fargo earnings, if you look at credit card payments or even delinquencies, that's where you start to see the cracks show up and that there have been late payments and there has been a slowdown in that usage. Speaking of cracks, though, is that kind of an anomaly or are there more to come? Is that, is that the canary in the coal mine? Um, possibly. I mean, we, are, we have been seeing that for a while, though. For the last six to 12 months, we have seen all of those uh, types of uh, Sort of late payment type measures picking up. Um, and that does tell you that the uh, lower income sector of, of the US economy is suffering right now. So high interest rates have affected them all. But the broader economy is actually doing okay. So what that tells you is that it may not necessarily be a canary in the coal mine in the sense that if you see ongoing weakness in this part of the economy, it doesn't necessarily transmit to the, mm. to the broader economy, especially in the context of the Fed cutting interest rates now. So there'll be much less pressure coming from interest rates going forward. Bill, you know, we get excited about the bank earnings story because of you know the sector but also what it tells us about the consumer as just discussed we get excited about the tech earnings story a, a lot increasingly it seems with what's going on with nvidia and its ability to sort of keep ahead of the competition and to make incredible profits whilst doing that what are you watching out for when it comes to this tech story now and the and the ai narrative is this something you're still investing around or does everything just look too expensive well it certainly does look too expensive but um you know, the stocks are doing well, so that tells you something. I mean, the good news is the valuations of these companies, these tech companies, are much better than, say, during the dot-com period. When, during the dot-com period, there was really a question of no earnings, poor cash flows, whereas today the companies which have high valuations, at least they have some cash flows. The, the difficulty we have is... Uh, at what point do companies think uh, that we need to scale back our AI investment because we need to see use cases? And that's been this ongoing debate for the last three to six months about the hype versus delivery of use cases. But so far, at least, it seems like companies are still focusing on this. Mm. Uh, we're a bit cautious about this whole story because we do think that companies will want to see some use cases have an impact on their bottom line. But at least price action seems to suggest markets don't care so much. We're about 21 days away from the U.S. election. What's the Trump trade? 
Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think the biggest Trump trade from a macro perspective is higher inflation because Trump, if he was to come into power, would introduce higher tariffs. He'd basically expel a large number of undocumented workers or even documented workers out of the U.S., which would have an impact on the, on the labor supply, and he'd introduce tax cuts. So all of this, however you slice and dice it, this, would, this is inflationary. So I think the, an inflation trade of some kind, which would be a higher long-term interest rates in the U.S., the possibility of Fed scaling back significantly its easings, I think that would be the big Trump trade. OK, Bilal, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Bilal Hafi, CEO of research uh, and research head at Macro Hive, of course. Let's get quickly to the core six and have a look at how those individual stocks are performing in the midst of a market that is broadly higher, up by three tenths of one percent. But with some notable underperformance coming through from London, we have weakness in energy stocks. More from uh, Joe, no doubt, on that in just a moment. The Cat Caron's also underperforming, maybe the luxury names in there. With all of that, yes, you can see LVMH is down by half a percent. So that speaks to that underperformance over in Paris. Uh, elsewhere, we see standout performance from the tech sector, ASML, up by just over 1%. So we keep our focus on tech, just as we did in the US session of yesterday. Let's get a check on individual stocks then and some of the sectors on the move. Joe has a briefing. Joe. So it is these oil stocks where we're seeing the main weakness at the open of trading today, particularly in the UK. BP, one of the worst, driving some underperformance in the FTSE 100. Also Total Energies, Repsol and Eni as well. Remember, these stocks are already down sharply over the past month or so. And this year, having a rough year. But that drop in the Brent crude price today is weighing on this sector once again. So really a weak part of the market. But one part of the market that is benefiting is the airline stocks. These are some of the best performance today given the potential reduction in fuel costs that this would mean. So we're seeing the likes of EasyJet, Air France, IAG and Lufthansa all gaining today. Bear in mind these UK names, EasyJet and IAG, already up really sharply. The British Airways owner up 40% this year already on a rebound in some of their passenger numbers. But that is a clear beneficiary of this declining oil price today. Then in terms of earnings, we got Ericsson. Finally, a bit of positivity on that one. We're up 10%. They're talking about a rebound in some of their infrastructure and also over in the U.S. in particular, given that deal with AT&T really benefiting the company at the moment. We can see that feeding through as well into Nokia, the big rival, that one gaining it around 1.8%. And down back in the U.K., Wise Transfer Wise reporting a big increase in money being transferred across borders. So that one looking pretty strong as well. Then staying in the U.K., in terms of your morning calls, it's very excited about NatWest, who I've been banking on, banking with for the past 20 years or so. They've got an upgrade to buy over at Jefferies, which does mean they no longer have a single sell. That's all due to the structural hedge, the rates benefits at the company. And then in terms of hedge funds, this one going the other way, Man Group downgraded at Exane, which says the hedge fund listed in the UK has seen a bit of a drop in some of its performances and some of its fees. So that one coming down pretty significantly, down 3.6%. And then according to City, we're not buying enough takeaway food at the moment. And they are downgrading Delivery Hero for this reason, saying they've seen a drop in web traffic for Delivery Hero. And that one is falling at 2% over in Germany this morning. Joe, thank you. Joe Easton from our equities team. Let's just quickly hit another piece of news, Critty, and this is around UBS. Now, it, it doesn't strike me as all that surprising that when you're a business the size of UBS and you take on a business the size of Credit Suisse, that maybe yeah. you need to look at your resolution plan. So what happens in the event of any kind of crisis here? And it does seem as if the regulator is minded to make that happen. So UBS uh, is going to uh, be asked to revise its recovery and emergency plans as a result of having taken on integrated Credit Suisse. It seems there's more work to do, all this to do with the you know, too big to fail uh, uh, rules yeah. around the banking sector. Yeah, and in the process, uh, suspended the annual approval of the recovery and emergency plans, as you were, you were pointing out. The shares down about 1.5% in trading. Unclear at the moment whether or not that's a cyclical trade or whether that's an actual response uh, to this move. But UBS shares under pressure. Coming up on the program, uh, we will get back to uh, what's going on in the auto space. We've had a lot of coverage of that sector recently and a lot of it coming together at the Paris Auto Show. Why German car makers are getting left in the dust by Chinese EV makers in their biggest and most lucrative market. We'll pick up on that theme in the context of all we've heard from Paris at that auto show. We'll bring in Oliver Crook shortly to the conversation. This is Bloomberg.
we need to find a deal with China, okay? And we need to get used to a form of competition, or in, in, that means basically on the one side you compete, on the other side you cooperate, as actually they did with us sure. when we went 25 years ago in China to take also advantage of the, of the Chinese market. That's the Renault CEO, Luca De Mayo, speaking to Bloomberg at the Paris Auto Show. Car makers have indicated that demand for electric vehicles is picking up as prices come down. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook has been in Paris. He was at the auto show. He's moved on now. But he's still thinking about what this means for the auto sector and thinking forward to <laughs> regulation around the auto sector. Oliver, good morning. So amid all of the tensions over tariffs, what did you learn then about how Chinese brands are approaching the European market? Yeah, listen, despite the fact that you sort of have the result of what happened here in Brussels in Paris there at the auto show is about this sort of legislation and these sort of tariffs going on in the Chinese automakers, basically they're not slowing down at all in terms of their sort of uh, uh, desire to get involved into the European market. And really what they're focused on now is not being sort of just categorized as just another Chinese brand. They really want to make distinctions between sort of each of the identities of these brands and really get in front of these European consumers. What I think is very interesting is how they're approaching basically that process. We still don't don't have the final tariffs. There is still some room for negotiations, though it seems unlikely that they will be materially different. What I think is very interesting is Stellantis, for example, has a joint venture now with the Chinese automaker for their production within Europe. They own 41 percent of that. And what's interesting about that is that they're sort of inverting the German model that we saw from the 1980s, where these German automakers came into the Chinese market, had joint ventures, started producing cars there, and really sort of ramping up the volumes. One of the big differences that we should bear in mind, though, is that back then in China, you didn't really have have an automotive industry, whereas in Europe you certainly do, and that is really at the heart of the debate that we're having here in Europe, from Paris all the way here back to Brussels. Give us a little bit more good news, perhaps, Ollie. When we're talking about EVs, it tends to be a lot of doom and gloom. Is there any reason for optimism? So listen, we're starting to see a little bit of a pickup in demand, according to a lot of the, ex the executives that we spoke to at the auto show. That is in part because they've been able to sort of reduce the pricing really substantially from a year or two years ago. But I think what was interesting is that this was really an EV auto show for a sort of market that doesn't really want EVs right now. And that's a real problem for the automakers for a number of reasons, not least of which you have new regulations, again, coming here from Brussels that kick in next year, where they basically need to sell a fifth of their cars. About 20 percent of their fleet needs to be EVs in order to avoid huge fines. We're talking about billions of euros worth of fines. And if the sort of policymakers here in Brussels do not want to adjust their targets, how do you adjust what the market wants? And that is exactly what we asked Carlos Tavares, the CEO of Stellantis, about how to sort of manage that transition with those big regulations coming in next year. Have a listen. Right now, we only ask two things to the governments and specifically the European governments. We ask stability of the rules. We do not ask for any kind of postponement because we are ethically committed to contribute to fixing the global warming. So we don't ask for any postponement. We ask for stability from one side. And from the other side, we ask the governments to stimulate the demand, which is not to help Stellantis, but to help the consumer so that the consumer can buy EVs at an affordable price. So a call there from Carlos Tavares to really stimulate the demand side of this. And the consequence of not doing that, guys, is going to be substantial, both from Luca De Mayo and Carlos Tavares, that basically that the number of factories that are currently operating in Europe may not be sustainable without that demand coming back. We've seen different opinions in Europe about these tariffs then, Oliver, and part of that's been to do with the exposure these car companies have to China. Meanwhile, in China, a lot of the German car makers losing some ground. Yeah, so listen, we had the third quarter numbers just a couple of days ago, and we just saw absolute brutal numbers from across the board from the German automakers. Mercedes down 13 percent and China, Porsche down 19 percent, BMW down 30 percent. There are two concerns here. There is one, the sort of domestic Chinese story about demand just not being there in general and the sort of stimulus coming into the economy. But I think an even bigger question there is, Anna, is once that demand comes back, will that demand be different from what it was before? Will that demand be for those German automakers? The reality of the situation is that more than 50 percent of new cars sold in China China right now are EVs, and the Germans are just flatly behind. All right. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook joining us out of Brussels after his stint in Paris. We thank you so much for that crucial contest. Let's talk about the other side of the movement this morning. That, of course, comes in oil prices tumbling after The Washington Post reported that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told the White House he's willing to strike Iran's military 
rather than oil or nuclear facilities. We're now joined by Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities, Will Kennedy, joining us around the table. Will, how much of the move that we're seeing in oil prices was actually a geopolitical premium baked into the price? A fair bit, I, I, I think. It was uh, clearly it touched $80 at the start of uh, last week, the highest we'd seen in uh, several months, and that was driven by the speculation uh, that came after President Biden addressed it in public comments that they would target oil infrastructure, and that has huge risks for the oil market in terms of limiting exports from Iran and ultimately if things uh, escalated to the wider, from the wider Persian Gulf. So any indication that's not going to happen will reduce the risk premium that we see in the market. At one point today, we were down more than $3 a barrel, back down to uh, almost 74 That's $6 off where we were at the start of last week. Right, so that's a substantial move. We see that playing out in oil markets, as you say, and then reading across into equity markets and beyond, Will. Um, what about the other side of this, which is not the supply side, but on demand? We've seen OPEC come through with revised expectations for what demand will look like. I think they're on the high side of expectations, even after they've cut them. But, but this is the sort of direction of travel, is it? Despite what China is doing. Yes, that's right. I think that underneath this geopolitical tension, the market has actually been following China very carefully and the discussions and we've seen about stimulus and how that's played out in other markets around the world. And I do think that in common with uh, some other markets, there is a degree of disappointment about some aspects of the stimulus policy um, from China and a, a great deal of concern about just how strong Chinese demand will be. It's looking pretty flat this year, which is unusual. It has traditionally been the biggest driver of global oil demand. And on top of the weakness you see in the China economy, you've also got their move towards electric vehicles, which is the biggest anywhere in the world. So you put all that together, together with OPEC plans to increase supply going into 2025. And there is a lot of concern among traders that the market doesn't look very tight next year, that it mm. looks a little bit loose. And that is the background playing underneath this uh, nearer-term tension about geopolitics. 30 seconds, I'm going to put you on the spot. We're 21 days away from the election. Does the election trade have any impact on oil? Yes, I think people will see that. Uh, yes, it does. It's hard to read. I mean, one aspect is that some people would tell you that Trump would be good for oil production in the U.S. I think that not everyone agrees with that point of view. On the other hand, Trump is likely to be much more hawkish on Iran, perhaps clamp down on Iranian exports, which could crimp supply. So... It can go both ways. Maybe it's a wash at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But it, it yeah. will matter if Trump wins the election to the old market for sure. Sounds like volatility is what we're in for. Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities, Will Kennedy, joining us around the table. Coming up on the program, taking a little bit of a pivot, getting a frontline view on the U.S. antitrust crackdown from the Justice Department's Heddle Doshi. Exclusive interview coming up next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Antitrust scrutiny remains an overhang in the tech sector. Take Google for one example. Embroiled in two separate antitrust trials brought by the U.S. Department of Justice, alleging that the tech leader illegally dominates online search and the roughly $675 billion digital advertising market. All while the company has beaten back European antitrust interventions, paying about, get this, 6.5 billion euros. U.S. enforcers still considering asking a federal judge to force Google to sell off parts of its business and what would be a historic breakup. We asked the Google CEO, Sundar Pichai, the Alphabet CEO, I should say, what, about the case. Take a listen to what he had to say last month reflecting on the antitrust trial in Virginia. That case is just getting underway, so I expect it to take, take some time. And, you know, but look, uh, where we can figure out uh, you know, constructive solutions, uh, I think we will, where we think it really harms our ability to innovate on behalf of our users or, uh, you know, we are going to be vigorous in defending ourselves and it's going to take time for, for it to play out. The Alphabet CEO, Sundar Pichai, talking about the threat to innovation. Let's bring in another voice from the other side of the coin. Hedel Doshi, the top antitrust litigator at the U.S. Department of Justice. Grace is our set with her presence. We thank you so much for joining the program. Look, this is something we talk about a lot, especially in Europe, about whether this kind of scrutiny, at the end of the day, disincentivizes innovation at a time when Europe really needs it. It's the argument that's uh, happening in Silicon Valley right now in terms of D.C.'s approach. What do you say to that, the threat to innovation? 
Thanks so much for having me here, and that's a great question. I, as you might imagine, I'm not going to comment on any pending litigation against any specific company, and we always you know, have the opportunity to speak through our filings in federal courts across America, and so we do so. Zooming out, though, a little bit to the broader question related to the tension between, or perceived tension between enforcement activity in the antitrust front versus innovation and entrepreneurship, I think that history has shown us that the considered judgment of regulatory bodies and legislative bodies across the world has really been that competition fuels entrepreneurship and innovation in a way unlike anything else. And that's why competition, rather than con consolidation or concentration of power, is prized in both regulatory and enforcement schemes across the world. The really important thing also with respect to that question, it's important to note here, is that I think that there is often a misapprehension or misunderstanding about whether antitrust enforcement in particular chills, for example, deal activity or things like that. And you know, I, I don't have the fiscal year for 2024 just ended, so I don't necessarily have that data in front of me today. But I do know that from the end of 2023, the fiscal year in 2023, that the deal volume stayed remarkably consistent. And so in HSR filings across America that have come to the Department of Justice or the FTC, we're talking about 1,800-ish reportable deals. And 24% of those are deals valued at above a billion dollars. And so the idea that deal activity has been chilled is really inconsistent with the data. And so what you will see is that enforcement activity is important and it, it is obviously getting a lot of attention and due scrutiny, but that doesn't mean that innovation or entrepreneurship is in any way quashed. It's quite the opposite. Talk to us then about kind of this moment that it feels like antitrust is having. I mean, we've talked about this going back to the late 90s in terms of Microsoft and the antitrust case there. And from a Wall Street perspective, it hasn't moved the dial because 25 years ago it didn't move the dial. But this resurgence, this bipartisan resurgence of, of antitrust when it comes to tackling big tech, it feels like it's having a particular moment right now. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think the conditions for success may be emerging now? Well, so I think I have to quibble a little bit with the premise of the question, which is to say that, you know, 25 years ago that there wasn't a value or an impact of enforcement activity. This Justice Department that's bringing or, you know, looking at antitrust enforcement in this modern moment is the same Justice Department that, you know, took on Standard Oil, AT&T, and then Microsoft. And I think that, you know, zooming out, again, not talking about any specific case, I think that the technological inflection that we face today and that allowed for innovation and entrepreneurship over the last 25 years is a result of, a byproduct of antitrust enforcement activity with respect to Microsoft, not in spite of. And so I think that it is important to note that these kinds of things are cyclical. There's a confluence to a lot of what's happening in the modern American economy. But the idea that antitrust enforcement is somehow an a hindrance to that is frankly belied by the facts. Okay, uh, Hetzel, you set that out very, very clearly. Just picking up on that theme and running with it a little more, I mean, it, it, these markets are not, uh, well, to some extent, tech markets are regional rather than global, but there is a global component to this. And some in the big tech space would argue, you know, don't clip our wings when we're trying to stand up to global competition. Is that an argument that finds any, finds any, uh, that needs airing at all, do you think? I mean, I think every argument is heard, certainly, by enforcers in terms of making considered judgments about which enforcement activities uh, to engage in. I think, though, that the idea that the answer to consolidation or concentration is more consolidation and concentration is something <laughs> that has been disproven empirically and across a variety of industries. And so I know that your question was animated specifically about the tech industry, but something that I see in my job on a day-to-day -day basis in federal courts across America is enforcement activity across a variety of sectors. And at various points in history, all of those sectors have made that argument, and we don't see that benefiting the American people. Okay. Well, I mean, on tech, you could argue that maybe it is just an American story and they're in quite different spaces compared to, to China, for example, where tech universes are quite separate. But in other industries, you could argue that, you know, this is a global competitive race and U.S. businesses, whether that's one at the top of the tree or a number competing to be at the top of the tree, want to take on China. I mean, that must be something that, 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 that you take seriously. Well, I mean, I think that geopolitical considerations are like any other consideration. There's a separate process in, at the Justice Department in terms of taking into the account those types of ideas and considerations. But if you think about the factors qua competition, 
right? And you think about, from a global perspective, supply chain issues, choke points, and things like that. Those are important considerations across a variety of industries, transnational or otherwise, and those are things that we look at. But that doesn't mean that's often not an argument in favor of cons concentration and consolidation. It's quite the opposite. It kind of comes down to the very conversation we have around the Federal Reserve at the moment, which is how are they thinking about inflation? Outline for us or connect the dots for what you do versus how it shows up for the consumer, for the American consumer. Right. So I think that one of the interesting things about antitrust enforcement in this modern era is that it is very consumer focused in a way that focuses on the necessities of life, not just high technology products or things like that, things that affect people's bottom lines. And so one of the great things about the position that I'm in is that I have the opportunity to hear from people all across America where they're talking about kitchen table type issues, right? Like what is the, the, the what are the issues that are facing farmers? How does that appear in agriculture? And interestingly, from a totally different side of the equation, how are labor issues presenting in antitrust enforcement and in questions about consolidation? And so you will see arguments related to monopsony or labor, like the buy side of that equation with respect to consolidation in merger activity and in questions around merger activity to say, if you remove one more player from this market, what does that do on the buy side of the equation in terms of the ability of workers to have the best option to receive the most compensation for their hard work. And that is something that's unique to this particular moment and that resonates with the American people, certainly. Yeah, certainly the non-compete uh, arguments are a, clear, a key factor right now in, in, in the United States. Heddle, don't go anywhere. We're going to bring you some sound from Margaret Vestire, of course, uh, who heads up the antitrust efforts for the EU Commission. She commented on, on the similar dynamic that you're talking about. Take a listen to what she had to say. You need to, of course, own your victories, but you also own your defeats. And we have had both. Uh, and hopefully that shows that we're willing to push the envelopes, also sometimes to take a risk in order uh, to try to make sure that the market serves the consumer uh, and that we are not just small pawns or meat for the machine. So Margaret Vestire there speaking in Brussels off of her own wins against cases on, on Google and Apple, which brings me to, I think, a key point here in London, which is, Antitrust scrutiny has been kind of a, a, an area of wins for a lot of the regulatory authorities here. I'm curious from your perspective what that collaboration looks like between the DOJ and, and the folks over here in Europe. There is an argument here that Europe is leading some of that regulatory scrutiny. How do you view that? Well, I think it's important to take a step back and note that our regulatory or our regimes are different in the sense that the European efforts are regulatory in nature, whereas what we do is enforcement in nature. And so we take the statutes that Congress gave us, you know, dating back to as early as 1890 in the early 1900s and say how do the facts and circumstances that present in the markets that we're looking at today align with those statutes and so I think that what's really important to note about the United States versus other parts of the world and antitrust enforcement or antitrust regulation is what an incredible moment it is for partnership viewing the ideas of transnational impacts of a lot of this consolidation and concentration and so that can present in a variety of ways in our criminal prosecution efforts that certainly means that non-U.S. companies that engage in hardcore antitrust cartel behavior yeah. could be brought and held to account in the American courts. But it also means things like in advance of the 2026 FIFA World Cup, for example, that we're partnering closely with our Canadian and Mexican counterparts to ensure that collusive activity is rooted out early and dealt with in a prompt manner. What does that look like in terms of that enforcement that you were talking about, though? What seems to be the right enforcement mechanism? Penalties, fines? an actual breakup? Is there one that seems to be a more effective mechanism than the other? I, unfortunately, the answer is it's very, very fact specific, right? And so what you will see in most of our litigations as well is that if and when we get to the stage where a remedy is appropriate, we have we take discovery on them. There's facts and circumstances that guide that. And so it is really a bespoke solution to the problem at hand. Can I ask you about where, uh, where this activity takes place then, Hetel? I'm thinking here, co colleagues are telling me that a lot of prior administrations settled a lot of this type of activity before it ever went to court, but now we're seeing more of these cases go to court. Is that something you're happy with? Is that something that's been a sort of conscious decision? Well, look, as a litigator, uh, it will probably surprise you to hear me say this, but it's not always the best, necessarily the best circumstance that all disputes end up in court. But that being said, as enforcers, we shouldn't, be scared to go to court when the facts and circumstances warranted and there's an important principle that requires vindication. And so 
Yes, it is true that we are seeing multifaceted issues related to competition and antitrust across the American market in particular. And so that's reflected in the fact that we have a number of enforcement actions pending across a variety of those industries. But that's not to say that that means that we're always looking for a fight in terms of litigation. It just means that there are important principles to vindicate. And we as enforcers and career public servants are leading this fight shouldn't back down from that fight. Hetel, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Hetel Doshi, so uh, the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division of the U.S. DOJ. Coming up on the program, we are going to return to one of the themes of the week, and that is the banking sector. UBS shares under pressure on news. It must revise emergency plans as a result of its Credit Suisse takeover. We will uh, dive deeper into what you need to know on that story. This is Bloomberg. All of the discussion today has not actually been about tax. It's been about planning. It's been about the regulatory environment. It's been about getting infrastructure moving much more quickly and the sort of apparatus of government working to that common end. That's the real discussion that's going on here. That's the real focus. And actually, contrary to perhaps what people might think, tax is not the first thing that businesses and investors are raising with me. First thing they're raising with me is, is it really your number one mission? Is it going to be stable and strategic and for the long term, to which the answer is yes? And um, are you prepared to do the tough things um, on execution and the deliverables, which is about you know, the length of time it takes uh, from investment decision to actually seeing a project materialise? That's where I think we've been able to do a lot of reassurance that, yes, we understand that, and we're determined to do the follow-through on growth that is desperately needed for investors, for our country, um, and for the jobs of the future. Um, but I, forgive me, Prime Minister, but I think a lot of people, they may not be talking about it to you, but a lot of people are worried in this sort of vacuum that we've had, quite a long wait for the budget, there's quite a lot of what might be, cons might be just crazy speculation around where capital gains tax might go, for example. So something like a 39% rate. Can you reassure people that whatever the change is, it won't be anything that significant? Well, quite a lot of speculation is, is getting pretty wide of the mark. But, <laughs> so you um, say that, 30, that 39 that's, is wide of wide the mark? Is, look, is, yeah, it's getting to the area which is, is wide of the mark. But I'm not going to fuel the speculation because we can go on like this for a very long time until Budget Day. Everybody knows that until Budget Day, uh, none of it is going to be um, revealed. It was important that when we came into office, into government... We looked at the books, we assessed the state of the economy, we needed to understand the damage that's been done and that £22 billion black hole is a real problem that we've got to deal with and make sure that we go through all the processes necessary for a properly thought through budget. That was the UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer speaking exclusively to Bloomberg at the International Investment Summit in London. And talking about tax there and having to bat back lots of questions about tax, obviously, Chrissy, because we've had to wait a long time until the budget. And there's been a lot of people suggesting what might be taxed increasingly to fill this uh, so-called black hole in the, uh, in the UK finances. Um, the, the other side of that is where they borrow money from. And interesting to note some of the research we've had out on gilts recently, because uh, we had City out with a note not long ago talking about, well, you know, is there the potential for a budget? A strike, a lot of nervousness around UK gilts as we run up to a budget, a fiscal event, the, the, the echoes of Liz, you know, the, the noise of Liz Truss in the background from a couple of years ago. Uh, even though no direct comparison at all, that is still very much in our lived experience and in our memories around the gilt markets. Yeah. So interesting that Goldman's out with a note today, or in the last 24 hours at least, saying that they think that whatever is in the budget is going to be fairly gilt friendly, which I think is a, an interesting one. Yeah, it is an interesting one. And then it feeds into this idea of how does that show up in, in how banks are preparing for that kind of volatility as, as well. If we do have that uh, lived memory, to your point of, of Liz trust that are all the banks around the world prepared for some sort of volatility, for some sort of shakeup in bonds, not just in the UK, mm. but the US election as well. And it kind of feels like that might be the focus this morning over in Switzerland. OK, yeah, let's talk about Switzerland and some of the regulatory measures there. Shares in UBS are in the red, although other financial services names also a little weaker this morning. Uh, but we have had this interesting new guidance out from FINMA. The uh, financial supervisor is requiring the bank to revise its emergency planning plans as a result of its uh, Credit Suisse takeover. Here with more 
Sport is Bloomberg's Bastian Benrath. Right, Bastian, give us an update here because, you know, we've had a really big bank taking on another really big bank. So it might not surprise people that that requires some rethink of what you'd do if this business had to be, had to be wound up. What, what are we learning here? We are learning that um, UBS has to um, has a lot of work to do in um, uh, incorporating um, the Credit Suisse business, and uh, especially like just on a technical level, like uh, you know bringing IT systems up to speed, like making sure everything works together. Um, and uh, it said, uh, like the regulator said, like as long as you haven't finished this business, we cannot sign off on your um, resolution plan. And um, uh, yeah, this is basically what happened. As you said, like it is kind of it was kind of to be expected but um yeah obviously it's like you don't want to read those news if you're at ubs that like the regulator says hey uh you have work to do there um they also said that uh ubs has to calculate more conservatively uh how much liquidity it can raise uh in the time of a crisis if a crisis should happen again uh, because there was obviously a um problem in the credit suisse crisis that they uh that like liquidity outflows were much larger than anyone had expected before and um, the Swiss regulators want to be prepared here, obviously, and says, uh, tell, tell UBS now, hey, you need to plan very comprehensively and need to plan very conservatively how much liquidity you're actually able to raise if it comes to a crisis again. Bastian, are there any more hurdles on the regulatory front from UBS and Credit Suisse? We know that after this merger, FINMA has uh, come with mixed results to how that new entity is meant to operate. We've had that current conversation on this very show uh, with the former FINMA regulator, Urban Anghern. But what are the next steps here? So basically, this in general, this process takes a while in Switzerland um, because a lot of uh, involved parties are going to be heard. Uh, the next step, which we are seeing, is uh, the result of a parliamentary probe, which is fairly uh, seldom that this happens. Uh, but the, the Swiss parliament has said we want to look at that. Lawmakers have said we want to investigate, especially if like all the authorities involved um, acted correctly. And the results of this probe are expected it about in December, early December, probably. And um, and then uh, it, it the process will go on and there will decisions be made like by how many reforms which the Swiss government has proposed uh, earlier this year. Um, which could see particularly higher capital requirements, increases in regulatory capital requirements for UBS of around 20 million. Um, and uh, we will see uh, what of that will actually be implemented. That is kind of a, an open question right now and a, uh, a discussion which is, which is going on. And we will see more clearly only, only next year. Like this will definitely take until then. Bloomberg's Bastian Benrath Wright joining us out of Zurich this morning to talk about uh, that, really, that relationship between FINMA and UBS. We thank you so much. Let's stick with the banking sector and switch over to the state. Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, all reporting earnings today, likely to flag rising revenue pressures uh, as the Wall Street giants start to reckon with those Fed rate cuts. Let's bring Charlie Wells uh, joining us patiently, waiting on set, to talk about what we can expect. Are we going to see the same outperformance there that we saw in J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo on Friday? No pressure on these banks, but they have some tough acts to follow. I think it's never fun to follow J.P. Morgan. You know, they beat on net interest income, which was unexpected. They beat on investment banking revenue. Wells Fargo ba beat on investment banking revenue. And I think that's going to be the hope across these big banks as they come into this um, huge earnings day. But let's not forget, they're doing so in a macro backdrop that's actually pretty favorable to them, right? The U.S. economy is strong. The consumer is showing relative signs of resilience. And, you know, the Fed cut only a couple of weeks ago. So it kind of remains to be seen how much of that cut mm. trickles down into these earnings reports. Yes, absolutely. And that was one of the key takeaways, wasn't it, from J.P. Morgan? Much talked about. So what are we expecting then from the top three that are out today? Goldman, B of A, City. Striking, you know, when you rewind back to conference season a month ago, you got a lot of kind of attempts to kind of temper the outlook from these executives. So David Solomon at Goldman was talking about how trading might not be so hot this quarter, potentially on course to be down 10 percent. That was striking. You look at Brian Moynihan at Bank of America. He was talking in a different light about investment banking, about how the transaction mix for that bank just hadn't been right in this quarter. And then interestingly, and I think we've been talking a lot about the consumer, Mark Mason at Citigroup, talking about a shift in consumption on card at Citi. And so move, seeing consumers move from kind of discretionary spending on card 
to necessities. And I think that could indicate some strain, which would differ from what we've seen at some of these banks. When we're talking about what we saw on some of these banks, it's a lot of green on the screen, good trading numbers, good investment banking numbers, despite kind of dead capital markets activity. The credit card payments weren't so hot, though. The delinquencies started to tick higher. How much of that do we see as kind of the canary in the coal mine for some of these other banks? That's what I think we really want to kind of square the circle on here, right? Because we're kind of getting mixed signals from the labor market. We're getting mixed signals from consumer sentiment. And I really want to see, you know, how does CARD perform at Citigroup versus, you know, a number of other banks? And also, you know, the sentiment that, you know, even within banks, it, it almost seemed like Jamie Dimon was in sort of a dour mood on Friday, whereas his CFO, Jeremy Barnum, was in a much more upbeat tone. And I think yeah. across the board, you did hear a little bit more upbeat sentiment coming out of J.P. Morgan and from Wells on the consumer. That's something to really hone in on today when management starts talking in those analyst calls. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thanks for the update, Bloomberg's Charlie Wells, setting you up for the bank earnings that we're going to hear about uh, later on today. Other things we will get today, 10 a.m. UK time, German Economic Sentiment Survey, that will be released. Euro Area Industrial Production, also uh, due. We'll have some data out of the U.S. on the manufacturing side. On U.S. politics, though, Critty, crucial uh, uh, point of the day to tune in. Bloomberg's uh, John Micklethwaite, our editor-in-chief, will be interviewing Donald Trump so plenty to talk about there. Um, I mean, it, it, interesting that yesterday, when he was on the campaign trail in Pennsylvania, uh, Trump was talking about deregulation of energy markets and home construction. So some, some, some uh, top-of-mind economic themes from his perspective that might get, uh, get a mention later on. This is where we had that conversation with Will Kennedy earlier on the show. Mm -hmm. What is the Trump trade when it comes to oil? Because, yeah. of course, he's going to be aligning with a lot of the southern states and the GOP uh, kind of take on, on fracking and, and oil access, which we know Biden has been more hesitant on. But we also know that the flip side of that is Kamala Harris's approach to fracking is that she doesn't want to ban it. She's actually diverging from Biden's policy in this area to really attract some of those independent voters mm. where jobs energy security are, yeah. are top of mind for that. And of course, I'm sure the conversation will go global as well and think about Trump, what Trump's policies would be if we saw Trump 2.0 as a presidency, what his policies for the rest of the world would be. And with that in mind, Will Kennedy mentioned policy toward Iran yeah. and that puts the Middle East uh, firmly in focus. So no doubt, a really interesting conversation coming up later in programming. That is 5pm at UK time. Bloomberg's John Micklethwaite interviewing former President Donald Trump. That is it for the opening trade. A mixed picture across European markets. Overall, stocks going higher uh, as we are almost an hour into trade. Underperformance, though, in London and in Paris. That is it for the opening trade. The Pulse is next. This is Bloomberg.